Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. Now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, who are you? This question, which the Jews asked St. John the Baptist, may be asked of any Christian. And I ask it of all of you, my brothers and sisters. Who are you? What are you? That is, where did you come from? Where are you going to? Who made you? Why are you on earth? These great truths, which should be the foundation and rule of all our actions in this world. It is because they do not reflect seriously on this that so many Christians live badly and damn themselves. All of you here present, where were, were you a hundred years ago? The world existed as it does today but you were not around. Where did your existence and all your goods come from? From chance. This is an empty word that doesn't mean anything. What would you say if I told you that this church or this watch were the result of chance? Of your parents? They will say to you, like the mother of the Maccabees, who said, It is not I who gave you life and soul, but the creator of the world. For if it were not so, where did they get, get their life from? From yourselves. But since you do not exist, how could you operate? Can nothing be the cause of being? You come from God. He made us, and not we ourselves. Yes, God created you as an effect of his love, preferring you to an infinity of other possible creatures, which he could have created, but did not. He has thought of you from all eternity. He made you in his image and likeness, and it is he who sustains you and preserves your life. For in him we live, move, and are. How many thanksgiving do we owe to God? How ungrateful are those who never thank him. Bless the Lord my soul and all that is within me, his holy name. If you come from God, and if it is God who created you and gave you everything, then he is your Lord, you are his property, you belong absolutely to him. He can dispose of you as he pleases, just as the worker does with his work, the painter with his picture. All that we have comes from him and belongs to him. Let us further add that man, having been lost through his own fault and made a slave of the devil, God had mercy on him and provided to save him his only son, who gave himself up to death to redeem him. Who has done something similar and so great to me, says St. Bernard, restoring me, teaching me many things, doing wonderful things for me, and endured for me hard and even harsh and unworthy things? We belong to God. You are not your own. You have been bought with a great price. If I am all God's, because he has made me, concludes the holy doctor, what will I gain by being redeemed in such a way? If you belong to God, you must therefore live for him and serve him, as a servant must serve his master. That is, you must consecrate to his service and glory the faculties, the strength, and the goods he has given you. What would you do with a servant who, instead of working for his master, worked just for himself or for other people? 
and that is not done for God, is lost for eternity. Man, says St. Ignatius of Loyola, was created for this purpose, to praise, revere, serve the Lord his God, and thus to arrive to eternal salvation. God, infinitely wise, has appointed to every creature its end, its destiny. With the greater reason, he has done this to man. Faith teaches this to us as well as reason. You have drawn us to you, O Lord, St. Augustine asks, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Far be it, may it be from your mind then, that God, to think that God would have created you just to seek riches, honor, and pleasures. Such an end would be unworthy of man and of his divine maker. You have been created, therefore, for a higher purpose, to love God and to do his will in this world, and thus to merit to enjoy his sight and his glory for all eternity. This is what distinguishes man from other created beings that have no reason. This is the true source of his greatness and happiness. If he works for an end other than God, man degrades himself and loses his peace. If, on the contrary, he is faithful, God will bestow on him in the next life riches that do not perish, true glory that does not pass away, in the incomparable and perfect happiness that is in his possession. Why then do men so poorly understand and value these truths, which are both consoling and salutary? Sons of men, how long will you be heavy-hearted? Why do you love vanity and seek for false things? Man, although he was so honorable, did not get, he did not get it, sorry. He became similar to beasts without reason and became like them. My brethren, remember without ceasing the nobility of your origin and the sublimity of your destiny. You come from God, you belong to God, and you are going to God. What glory and what happiness. At the time when John the Baptist was baptizing, the learned Jews knew from the prophecies that the time of the Messiah was at hand. On the other hand, at that time in all Judea, people were talking about John the Baptist, of his birth and his extraordinary life, of his virtues, which were appearing divine rather than human, of his preaching and of his baptism on the banks of the Jordan. The people, seeing him a superior being, flocked to hear him, and judging by what they witnessed, many were inclined to believe that he was the Messiah, the Messiah so long awaited and so ardently desired. There was so much excellence in John, so that Christ may be believed, said St. Augustine. The Sanhedrin of Jerusalem to which pertained the examination of all religious questions, was alarmed at this growing reputation of John, but not daring, for fear of the people, to forbid him to preach and to baptize. They resolved to send him a solemn deputation of priests and Levites, official custodians and interpreters of the law and religion, so that they might publicly interrogate him concerning his mission and the mystery which he claimed to be. Who are you? It should be noted that this Sanhedrin was composed of Pharisees who hated St. John either out of envy or because John, from the first days of his preaching, had vigorously attacked their vices. Hence, the real motive of this deputation was not so much zeal for religion as hatred against the holy forerunner and the secret desire to discredit him before the people. But God, whose ways are infinitely wise, willed that this deputation should be an occasion for a solemn 
and it, as it was official testimony to the fulfillment of the prophetic oracles concerning the coming of the Messiah and the advent of that long-awaited Redeemer, and that it should serve as a confusion to the Jews and a glorification to our Lord and his forerunner. Therefore, the evangelist relates since it so carefully and accurately. This took place some time after Jesus' baptism and probably while he was still in the desert. Let us note that the Holy Percursus answers to all the questions that will be put to him reveal admirable candor, frankness and humility and at the same time great firmness and divine wisdom. To the first quest, general question, who are you? What will St. John answer? He confessed and did not deny, I am not the Christ. The evangelist says the same thing three times, observes St. John Chrysostom, and this repetition has the manifest purpose of emphasizing the frankness, energy, clarity, and promptness with which John repels the undeserved title that they wanted to attribute to him. As a loyal servant, he refuses to usurp the honor that should belong exclusively to his Lord. What a lesson in humility for all Christians, and more especially for us ministers of Jesus Christ. How many of us do not see out there who are willingly to, to, how many do we not see out there who are willing to accept and even eagerly seeking fulfillment and honors that are not due to them? And they asked him, What then? Are you Elias? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Most interpreters understand by this word prophet not only a prophet par excellence, that is according to some Jeremiah whom the Jews thought would return at the time of the Messiah, according to others, that extraordinary prophet announced by Moses, who is really none other than the Messiah himself, but whom the Jews referred to another personage who would be his cooperator. John answers with the same simplicity and even more briefly, no, no, always no, and always not, exclaims Bossuet, because John, in his own eyes, is nothing. And though he is so excellent, it is as if he were not, he is nothing. We are so little like him. How many of us are modest enough to like to make their nothingness be visible to others. Generally, one tries rather to make the, everyone see what he is, and one thinks he has only done what is good and honorable. Where do we stand? His answer, always brief, contains at the same time the explanation and justification of his baptism and the explicit announcement of the Messiah and his greatness. The Holy Precursor is happy to lower himself and to exalt his Lord. I only baptize in water. My baptism is a mere ceremony. It does not purify souls. It is no more than the sign of penance, the design to purify them and to prepare them for the other, more excellent baptism, which will sanctify them and communicate to them the grace of the Holy Spirit. It is only an exterior rite, a symbol, a preparation for the true baptism that confers the grace of God. Let us entrust ourselves to Our Lady, the Mother and Mediatrix of all graces, which we received at baptism as well as afterwards, that she may teach us to be always humble and open to the grace of God, being always most grateful for everything what God has done for us. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary and Joseph be blessed, now and forever. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.